Hello everybody, uh, this is uh, Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Uh, this is part four on my talk on Calvinism. And now I'm going to go into the claim that Calvinism destroys God's justice. Uh, let's see why Calvin's version of predestination is unjust and insane. Now, I'm going to be reading quotes from various Calvinists, and I'm going to just respond to it, and I want you to hear what they say. These words were taken from a popular uh, R.C. Sproul uh, video. Starkly reveal the dark underbelly of the Calvinist concept of justice. Quote, May the Lord curse you and abandon you, May the Lord keep you in darkness and give you only judgment without grace. May the Lord turn his back upon you and remove his peace from you forever. Unquote. That's a prayer for R.C. Sproul, one of the famous uh, Calvinists today. Doesn't sound like a Christian prayer to me. Uh, now, imagine a, a potter who labors continually until he has created a number of excellently wrought vessels of beauty. But he is not satisfied with that. He must also construct a second class of vessels in order to smash them into uh, a hundred bits of pieces. This proves to everyone that he has strength. The God of Calvinism is like this potter. He must have two classes of people, one group with which to demonstrate his love and mercy, and another group with which to demonstrate his wrath and hatred of sin. This is a, to some of you who are unfamiliar with this. This may seem far-fetched, but I'm, I'm going to make the case, you know, by quoting uh, the uh, Augustine, Calvin, uh, and, and then the contemporary Calvinists today, like MacArthur, Piper, Washer, Comfort, they're, they're, they're all Calvinists. Uh, the idea here is that God could not have properly saved the elect let alone demonstrate his justice to them, without having a group of people with whom he can be angry for all eternity. In other words, uh, you have to have a group of people who are damned, otherwise you can't say the other group is saved. You, you have to have a, 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 peop, a group of people where God's angry and tormenting forever, so that other people can feel good and loved because <laughs> they're special and God loved them. Now, as Douglas Wilson once put it on his blog, in a world without sin, two of God's most glorious attributes, his justice and his mercy, would go undisplayed. So the Calvinist way of thinking is that there has to be sin. God had to make sin so that he would have be able to display his justice and his mercy. Jonathan Edwards expressed a similar idea when he wrote, It is a proper and excellent thing for in infinite glory to shine forth, and for the same reason it is proper that the shining forth of God's glory should be complete, that is, that all parts of his glory should shine forth, that every beauty should be proportionally effulgent, that the beholder may have a proper notion of God. It is not proper that one glory, uh, uh, not proper that one glory should be exceedingly manifested and another not at all. Thus it is necessary that God's awful majesty, his authority and dreadful just greatness, justice and holiness should be manifested but this could not be unless sin 
and punishment had been decreed. Sin and punishment had been decreed. Pay close attention. They're making the case that God decreed that sin must come about. God decreed it. God authored it. So that the shining forth of God's glory would be very perfect. Both because these parts of divine glory would not shine forth as the others do. And also the glory of his goodness, love, and holiness would be faint without them. Nay, they could scarcely shine forth at all. So they're arguing that all of these uh, attributes of God could only be displayed and, and, and shine. And God get glory for all these, these attributes is uh, he, he had to, to create sin and so that he could demonstrate his, his, his mercy. Uh, I don't think that's how it happened at all. I think Adam and Eve had free will. They could, they could exist in the garden and all of eternity could have just existed by resting in God, trusting in God to provide everything for them. But instead they decided to go to the tree of the knowledge of good and evil because they decided of their own free will that they were going to try to exist in a different way through uh, being able to be like God and knowing the knowledge of good and evil, being able to choose to do good and not evil. That's what they chose. And because of that, they made a free will decision and they fell and sin came into being. Uh, now, God had to give them a free will choice all along because love can only exist with free will. Love cannot exist in a robotic relationship. It goes on to say, if it were not right that God, this is still Jonathan Edwards, if it were not right that God should decree and permit and punish sin, God decrees sin. He decrees it, permits it, and then punishes it. There could be no manifestation of God's holiness in hatred of sin. <laughs> you get that? The only way God could show, you, show that he hates sin is he had to invent it, decree it, and make it come about and make you sin so they could show how much he hates it. This is insanity. Or is showing any preference in his providence of godliness before it. There would be no manifestation of God's grace or true goodness. If there was no sin to be pardoned, no misery to be saved from, how much happiness soever he bestowed, his goodness would not be so much prized and admired. I mean, uh, I, I don't know about you, but if I could exist in the garden as Adam and Eve did before sin came in, uh, I think that we would all be very capable of seeing how much love our, our Creator had for us. His love would still be known. It wouldn't be secret that we didn't understand His love because He didn't bring in sin and make us sin and then punish people to show how much He hates sin and, and then make you feel special because you're the elect and now you feel loved. This is, I'd like to have some kind of a psychiatrist, psychologist analyze this. This is some kind of I sure they come up with some kind of psychological diagnosis for this state of mind. So evil is necessary in order to the highest happiness of the creature and the completeness of that communication of God for which he made the world. You can't be happy. You can't be completely happy unless evil exists. Because the creature's happiness consists in the knowledge of God and the sense of his love. You don't think that you could sense God's love if there was no sin? How are we, how are we possibly going to exist in eternity, in perfection? There will be no sin. Does that mean God's attributes, uh, all these attributes of love and uh, justice and 
Uh, you know, all these things are going to be non-existent because in eternity there will be no sin. This is so absurd. It's insane. And the and if the knowledge of Him is be imperfect, the happiness of the creature must be proportionally imperfect. Wow. That's Jonathan Edwards, a hero of of Calvinism. Now here's a. The same notion is present in the works of Augustine. Remember, Augustine is the one that really originated this from, uh, from his uh, debates with the Gnostics. If all had remained condemned uh, to the punishment entailed by just con condemnation, then God's merciful grace would not have been seen at work in anyone. On the other hand, if all had been transferred from darkness to light, the truth of God's vengeance would not have been made evident. That's from his writing, The City of God. So, uh, not everybody could be lost because and then we wouldn't know about God's mercy. And not everybody could be saved because then we wouldn't know about God's vengeance. You see how this is fitting not with theology, but with philosophy. Interestingly, Augustine unwittingly imported this idea into Christian theology from his Manichaean background, and it was taken up and further systematized by the reformers. We get a sense of just how indebted Augustine's theories about evil were to his Manichaean background in the following quotation, where good and evil create an antithesis necessary for maintaining the balance in the universe. This is starting to sound to me like Buddhism here. Uh, you know, yin and yang and karma. All right. Uh, and thus evils, which God does not love, this is, uh, this is the quote from, I guess, coming up from uh, from. Augustine, and thus evils, which God does not love, are not apart from order, and nevertheless he does love order itself, this very thing he loves, to love good things and not to love evil things, and this itself is a thing of magnificent order and of divine arrangement. And because this orderly arrangement maintains the harmony of the universe by this very contrast, it comes about that evil things must need be. God couldn't be happy without evil. In this way, the beauty of all things is in a manner configured, as it were, from antithesis, that is, from opposites. This is pleasing to us even in discourse. Not pleasing to me in discourse. It makes me sick. And I hope you're watching this now. This kind of philosophy should make you sick. The problem with these con conjectures is that they essentially assert that God requires an opposite, an antithesis, in order for him to be good. Or at least for his goodness to be fully actualized and manifested. It requires us to assert, at least if we are consistent, that through all eternity, the goodness and justice inherent in the Blessed Trinity was always incomplete, because it wasn't until evil came along that all the unrealized potencies in the Godhead could finally be realized. So if we take this to uh, extend it to its logical conclusion, you'd have to think that before evil came into the world, when God existed in his triunity, and there was no evil, that uh, this was an incomplete state, and it was uh, God's God's all God's goodness couldn't f fully be uh, uh, actualized or manifested. So there was no. Um, And John, now, now we're going to look at John Piper. He, he suggests that the pain 
evil and misery of some are necessary precondition for the ever-increasing enjoyment of the saints. Hmm. Man, this is this is sounding a lot like uh, I see in some of these um, uh, psychological shows I watch on TV about serial killers. <laughs> John Piper suggests that the pain and evil and misery of some are a necessary precondition for the ever increasing enjoyment of the saints. I'm a saint. Everyone who puts their faith completely in Jesus for salvation is a saint. We're saved saints. And I don't get any pleasure out of pain, evil, and misery in other people. I hope you don't either. But apparently John Piper does. This seems to leave us with a kind of dualism since it makes goodness eternally dependent on evil. Again, if this taken to its logical conclusion, this would entail that evil must be just as eternal as the Blessed Trinity. So, not only would evil have to exist before it's declared to exist in the scriptures, it had to bless it through, throughout eternity. Uh, and, and also, we're going to have to assume that for things to be good in the future, in the future eternity, that we're supposed to see there will be no more sin or death or tears, that, that it, it, things will be incomplete because there, there's got to be some kind of evil to exist so we can feel good that we're, there's a, an evil group and now we're the good group. On the other hand, if the members of the Trinity are completely self-sufficient and could fully appreciate their own justice and independent of creation, then presumably it would also be possible for God's redeemed and glorified children to appreciate God's goodness and justice apart from the, the existence of evil. I think that's true. I think that we're going to appreciate uh, the, the greatness of, and love of God e even in eternity when there's no evil. So why was that necessary to, uh, to take place in the past for God to all of God's virtue and uh, qualities to be uh, brought forth? If evil is necessary in order for God's goodness to be manifested, and if man is... The manifestation of such goodness is a crucial part of what it means for God to be Lord, since otherwise God's hatred of sin could not find an outlet. Then it follows that creation is necessary in order for God to be Lord. In other words, uh, if there had to be uh, evil for God to be uh, God, then for God to be Lord, there had to be creation. So God must not have been Lord from, um, before creation. As creation itself is a precondition to evil. In that case, God would not be Lord prior to creation. Ergo, creation is not an overflow of God's abundance, but something that was necessary in order to realize a certain aspect of his character. This lands us uncomfortably close to what some Arians have proposed. I know Arians who have said that in order for God to be Lord, he must eternally be Lord over something. Ergo, the Son must be eternally subordinate to the authority of God the Father. A similar logic lies behind much Calvinistic speculation. You see where this kind of philosophical thinking leads, that, that uh, Jesus is not co-equal to God in, 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 in eternity, that he was subordinate. This is getting close to what, uh, you know, the, the other cults would, would declare. Right? Jesus is a creature. He's, uh, he, he's less. He's a God, not the God. I don't need to go down to the local dump and glaze upon, gaze upon the garbage there in order to appreciate the beauty of nature. That's a very good point. Can you appreciate the beauty of nature without having to compare it to a dump? Can we recognize beauty without having a dump to contrast it? I think we can. I don't need to feed on putrefied fruit 
and rotting bread in order to enjoy lamb chops. Similarly, I'm sure that the persons of the, the Blessed Trinity were fully capable of appreciating one another's love prior to the advent of evil. You know, the more I, I study the philosophy of Calvinism, the, the, the more it, it, it really sickens me. Um, is there an alternative explanation for why a God who is all-powerful and all-knowing and all-good would allow evil to exist? Is there? Does evil have to exist so that God can have a contrast to show that he's good? You can't, you can't recognize the goodness of God unless there's a contrast and antithesis, evil? That's what the Calvinist philosophy is. But I say no. Uh, uh, the alternative is uh, free will. In order to have love, we must have free will. If I, if I was to be able to uh, design a robot and program it with the greatest technology and, and this, make this robot like devoted to everything I want to do, it was, it was completely uh, fulfilling every one of my needs. Is the, cap is the robot capable of loving me? Because he doesn't have uh, a free will. He, he just has a program that he must do things. That's not love. So the alternative viewpoint is simply that God desires a love partner. The Father, Son, and Holy Spirit love each other. God is love. God has to have, love must have an object. Love can't exist without an object. So the triunity of God all existed through eternity, and there was this love between Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And then God decided, let us make man in our image, in our likeness. Why? Because he wanted uh, someone else to love, and he wanted someone to love him. And we could not love him without free will. But the cost of free will is you could, you could choose to go your own way. The Bible says, all we like sheep have gone astray. We've all gone our own way. And that's, that's why evil exists. Because uh, in order for us to, God to have a love relationship with us, he had to give us free will. And along with free will came rebellion. So now Calvinism asserts that evil exists because God wants it to be there. End of story. On one hand, they say God hates sin, God hates evil, but God must love it because it's the, it's the way that he's able to show how good he is. As Calvin put it in his Institutes of the Christian Religion, quote, I say with Augustine that the Lord had created those who, as he certainly foreknew, were to go to destruction, and he did so because he so willed, unquote. simply because he willed it, he, because it was his will to send people into destruction. While later Calvin extends this idea to its consistent corollary, which is that, quote, man, by the righteous impulsion of God, does, what, does that which is unlawful. So man does unlawful things, that's sin, by the impulsion of God. God impels us to do it. God makes us sin. Now, if I was to take a, a little child, and because I'm much stronger than a little child, make, grab a little child, put a gun in the child's hand, and forcibly force the child to shoot someone and kill someone, who is the murderer? Could we say the child is the murderer? The child is the one that had the gun. But I'm the one that compels the child to commit the murder. In this way, they make God a murderer. They make God a rapist. 
Think right now. Imagine the most heinous acts of all humanity throughout history. According to this, God forced Hitler to do everything he did. God had forced every serial killer, every child molester, every murderer, every fornicator, every adulterer, Pick your poison, pick your whatever you think is the most horrible. God made them do it, so therefore God is really the rapist. God is the murderer. Not my God. That's not my God. In other words, according to Calvin, the sinner sins because God impels him to do so. Calvin picked up on this same theme later when he wrote that man falls... The providence of God so ordaining that by the will of God all the sons of Adam fell into the state of wretchedness in which they are now involved, nor ought it to seem absurd when I say that God not only foresaw the fall of the first man and in him the ruin of his posterity, but also at his own pleasure arranged it. So let's not deny it. It's not just a misunderstanding. It's not just a minor disagreement. This is the worst of all heresies, saying that God is evil. God arranged sin. God requires sin to be happy. God requires evil acts to be happy. God, in his own pleasure, arranged evil the, these are difficult words, especially since they appear to directly implicate God in all the wickedness of the world. Uh, let's read Psalm 5.4. For you are not a God who wills lawlessness. So Psalm 4 says that God does not will lawlessness. This completely contradicts the scriptures. Now, this was impressed upon me when uh, our former church put on a family camp and invited R.C. Sproul Jr. to speak. The younger Sproul has taken Calvin's teachings to such an extreme, going even further than his father, let alone Calvin himself. For example, R.C. Sproul Jr. took particular delight in describing to us in detail how God desired sin to come about and how God forced the devil to sin, uh, like a man operating a remote control. In his book, Almighty, Over, Almighty Overall, uh, Sproul expands on this point, writing, quote, I am suggesting that he, God, created sin, where I'm, I must ask, does the law of God forbid the creation of evil? I would suggest that it just isn't there. Well, I just read a verse, uh, Psalm 5.4. There's many more, but Psalm 5.4 com completely says the opposite. R.C. Sproul Jr. posted a Facebook status saying that since God is sovereign, even those things which are not as they ought to be really are just as things ought to be. He went on to say that there are ultimately no bad things since God is completely sovereign. So, I mean, some horrible thing happens. I can't say it's a horrible thing. When someone commits the, the most heinous, despicable, evil act, imagine whatever is worst in your mind when something like that happens to someone. We cannot say, that's horrible, that's tragic. We have to say, no, it's not bad, it's good. Because God is sovereign, that's his will. God wanted it to happen. God made it happen. If the scroll maintains God is the author of evil, then we would have to say that he fosters wickedness in people's hearts. But if so, then God is sinful by the biblical definitions of sin and evil. Consider that in the Proverbs, the ones who incite and tempt evil, like the fool's friends or the prostitute, are as morally guilty as the simple man who falls prey to those temptations. 
So this is what I'm, I keep on saying, that the God of Calvinism is not really the God of the Bible. The God of Calvinism is not love, but hate and evil. And before I would ever accept Calvinism, if I thought the Bible really supported Calvinism, I wouldn't believe the Bible. Uh, instead, I'd be a Buddhist or an atheist. And this is exactly what's happening in the world. When people hear about Christianity from the Calvinist perspective, they say, I don't want anything to do with that. God's evil. It's easy for anyone to see. This makes God evil rather than Satan. It makes God the sinner rather than man. Under this scheme, the words God is good are no longer intelligible as God is violating his own self-revelation of what constitutes goodness. Moreover, if God is the author of evil, then we would have to conclude that evil is just as much an intrinsic part of God's character as his goodness. That's not my God. This, this has pastoral implications when dealing with people who have been subject to either grief or abuse. Certain extreme Calvinists will confront human grief with the words uh, uh, of Rudigast's famous hymn, What e'er my God ordains is right. Their approach is, this is happening, therefore God ordained it, therefore it must be right. So next time there's some tragedy in your family, someone's child was hit by a, and killed by a, uh, a drunk driver. You go to that person and you say, this is the will of God, this is good. I want to address Piper's latest remarks, which I find to be profoundly disturbing uh, in, in the Christian uh, post. John Piper responded to the question, what made it okay for God to kill women and children in the Old Testament? With, Piper said, Quote, it is right for God to slaughter women and children any time he pleases. God gives life and he takes life. Everybody who dies, dies because God wills that they die. God is taking life every day. He will take 50,000 lives today. Life is in God's hand. God decides when your last heartbeat will be and whether it ends through cancer or a bullet wound. God governs, so God is God. He rules and governs everything, and everything he does is just and right and good. God owes us nothing, unquote. Well, uh, MacArthur, Piper, Washer, uh, uh, James White, these are all Calvinists, and they've all been asked the direct question, and, and that is that, uh, uh, do you believe that someone uh, molests and rapes a little child, a pedophile, that God willed it, God controlled him and made it, made it happen? They're forced to say yes, and it's good, it's for God's glory. That's what you have to embrace if you want to be a Calvinist. According to Calvin, God rejects or, or reprobates some people, excluding them from salvation, and thus consigning them to eternal torment and to ensure their fate, hardening their hearts so that they cannot seek or receive grace. God does this simply on the basis that it pleases him to do so. In Calvin's view, there can be no higher reason. To me, Calvin's doctrine makes God into an evil, controlling, callous, even capricious deity, bringing countless miserable beings into existence with the sole end of tormenting them forever to display his own righteousness and justice. Huh. He, the saying, God loves you and has a perfect plan for your life. You've heard that? Eternal suffering for his glory. I find it hard to comprehend how anyone could worship such a being except perhaps out of abject terror. Well, I hope now you can see why I hate Calvinism. Because like Arminianism, Calvinism 
and Arminianism require works for salvation. That's not biblical. That's not the free grace message. Uh, that's not salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. They both require works. But what really sickens me is what Calvinism does to our great God and Savior. It turns him into an evil, evil, callous, petty, sickening God that I could never worship, never love, and can never believe in. So that'll end this part four. And uh, now we've talked about predestination from a Calvinist perspective, part five. I'm going to talk about predestination from a biblical perspective, the true understanding of what predestination really means. Thank you for watching. Bless you. And rest in the love and grace of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ.